We'll start with the crew patch again and a view from orbit. Uh, the crew patch is still flying on orbit, uh, firmly affixed to the bulkhead of Mir in the core module. Uh, meanwhile, uh, before dawn, the uh, vehicle was prepped on the pad. We actually woke up uh, before midnight. Launch morning for us was actually launch afternoon as we were already operating on Moscow time. We'd had a significant sleep shift. Here, uh, getting into the suits after the uh, morning or afternoon for us, uh, weather brief. We had a chance to take a look at uh, the, what the towel weather was, what the forecast for the Cape was. Uh, Chris had already been through his suit pressure checks. He was obviously ready to go. Uh, Jerry's always ready. And uh, we had just got back from uh, weather, uh, weather briefs and checks. Bill also had already completed all that work. And we had a little bit of a chance to relax in the uh, chairs there before it was time to come out. Well, here we are coming out of the ONC, and one of the most pleasant surprises, in addition to some of the media that was there to take our picture, was to see some of the same faces I see here today enjoying this briefing. They were there to greet us and to give us a bon voyage on our way. So thanks for the, our training team and the rest of the people who traveled down there to say goodbye. We saw a beautiful sunrise over the Atlantic Ocean, and then we got to go from launch from LCC. Kim waved uh, goodbye at two minutes prior to launch, and at six seconds prior, the main engines cranked up, and exactly on time, the solid rocket boosters ignited, and the hold down bolts let go and we were on our way. And there's absolutely no doubt at this point in your mind that you know you're going somewhere. The, uh, the, the first stage ride is, is uh, buckboard rough. It's, it's a lot of vibration, a lot of noise. It's an impressive thing to be a part of. We punched through a, a low cloud deck right there and came out the other side and, and the people who had assembled for our launch got one last view of us as we headed out over, over the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, second stage ride is incredibly smooth, just as rough as first stage is. Second stage is just incredibly smooth and quiet. Once we got on orbit and opened up the payload bay doors, uh, here's an example of some of the beautiful views that we got. These are the snow-covered Pyrenees Mountains, France to the north, Spain to the south, the islands of Mallorca and Menorca right here. And uh, this is actually a better view than I often got from space because I'm not having to compete with the other four guys for uh, <laughs> a window room right here. One of the first orders of business was to assemble the docking module in the bay. Um, and that involved uh, using the Canadarm, and I had the honor of being the first Canadian to ever operate the Canadarm up in space. So it was a real thrill for me to use this big piece of equipment to install this large five-ton uh, five Russian docking module onto the top of the orbiter docking station here in preparation for attaching it to Mir. I used a bunch of different visual cues. Uh, Space Vision System was one of them, which looked at the dots here, compared them to the dots up here, and gave me relative position inside the cockpit. I also had this view here, which is a centerline camera. You can see there's an actual reflection in this mirror of the camera itself. And by the camera looking at its own reflection, I could align things very carefully. But we got it uh, carefully in position within about uh, fractions of an inch and fractions of a degree, and then Ken fired the thrusters and slammed the two mechanisms home, and it worked exactly like all of the people at JSC had told us, uh, and the mechanism just worked perfectly to lock them together. Well, after we had uh, uh, successfully installed the docking module, now it came time for our next big task was to put the dock, take the docking module to its home in space, and uh, it was, we could see Mir from a long way out. Um, the initial burns were done up on the forward flight deck, and then uh, we moved uh, uh, Ken moved back to the uh, aft flight deck so we could uh, continue with our operations. Uh, here you can see uh, I'm uh, working with the uh, rendezvous uh, computers. Uh, Chris was taking uh, shots out the overhead window with the laser. Uh, here he is taking the uh, handheld laser marks. We also had two uh, laser systems in the payload bay. And uh, it was great. It was a beautiful sight. As we got closer to Mir, I think the activity on the flight deck increased. Uh, Chris began to really operate the cameras. Bill shifted over to lasers as the TCS dropped offline. Uh, Jim was busy uh, keeping track of the timing and the timeline and the orbiter, and Jerry shot a lot of these pictures as well as operated the IMAX camera. I think this is where you see that all the training and teamwork uh, really come into play because everybody was uh, doing all the things we'd been trained to do. We were working very closely, and we were able to bring these two pieces of Russian hardware together uh, on orbit 215 miles up, uh, exactly where the Russians wanted them. And as you'll see from the outside view, the, uh, the whole operation proceeded very gradually. There in the lower right, you can see the view if you were sitting out on the left wingtip as these two parts come together. You might have noticed that we had a little trouble with that target. Some of the paint had peeled back, and uh, that uh, will be replaced in future. 
Here, just about this point, the orbiter jets fired and accelerated the two pieces of hardware together. The latch is captured, and uh, we were docked to Mir. At this point, all the activity on the inside shifted to operating the APDS and drawing the two vehicles together. Well, this is our first chance to relax just a little bit and give us a chance to really get a, a great view of the, uh, the Mir space station as we we're also going through a series of pressure checks which would allow us to open up the hatches in between. We also had a chance to capture on film the, uh, one of the solar rays right out the overhead window as it was uh, rotating to track the sun as we kept our merry go, go around around the world. Here's Ken opening up the hatch uh, that goes from the docking module into the crystal module of Mir. And as he opened up the hatch, uh, the Mir crew was very excited to come in and, and see everybody. They'd been on over for about two and a half months at this point. This is the commander, Sergei, or Yuri, sorry, Yuri. And here's Thomas, the German ESA cosmonaut. And Sergei Avdev, the uh, board engineer, will be coming through in just a second here. After this was completed, we went back in the mirror and uh, conducted a series of, uh, of video cons down to the ground, and then we went right back to work. What we're going to show you here is a transfer of the protein crystal growth experiment from the shuttle over to the Mirror Space Station, and then uh, we returned a similar experiment that had been placed there by STS-71 uh, and returned it back to the orbiter. Uh, what we're trying to give you here is an impression, as you saw in the slides, for the, the length of the runs in the various different modules, but also the amount of clutter and stowage that has uh, accumulated over the 10 years of living in space with various different Mir crews. As Chris uh, indicated earlier, we did uh, transfer over uh, 2,000 pounds of hardware and, and supplies to the uh, Mir uh, station. And in addition, we returned something in excess of 800 pounds of equipment and uh, experimental results that uh, scientists will be looking at for some time to come. This is going right through the base block of the uh, Mir and into the Kavant 1 module. And you're seeing uh, Yuri and Sergey remove the old PCG experiment, and I'm handing them a new one. In addition to the science we had on board, we also realized that we were these people's only visitors in a six-month stay on orbit, and we tried to bring them things that would improve the quality of their life, which here included ice cream sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> and I have never seen three grown men eat ice cream as uh, happily as those three guys did. <laughs> See, eating up an ice cream sandwich, and then uh, Yuri floats the last of his little mini dove bar into his mouth there. And they, they were very happy that, that we had thought of this and brought them those, exper uh, those uh, experiments. Those, uh, <laughs> <laughs> my lips were moving. Hey, uh, brought them that. But the gift that uh, I think really meant the most was to bring Thomas this guitar. Um, they have this old guitar that actually went up in Salyut 7. It's one of the oldest items in space. It's been up there for 15 years. We brought him a new classical practice guitar and had this opportunity to play together and sing in the Mir core, which was just very memorable for both of us. Well, we did actually do quite a bit of work while we were up there. Uh, you could see the arm in position to uh, gather data from mere jet firings, part of a series of experiments uh, in which we were trying to get data that will help us uh, understand how the shuttle will inter interact with the International Space Station. It was really quite a thrill to be maneuvering the arm or in, in proximity to the solar arrays, and uh, as it turned out, it was quite a thrill for uh, Yuri to see that as well. Here you can see uh, things are starting to get ready to take a little bit sadder note. Uh, these are folks that we became close friends with on orbit, uh, correction, on the ground, and became just lifelong friends with on orbit. And unfortunately, at some point, it was time to say goodbye. And here, as was quite appropriate, uh, Ken is the last one uh, from the Atlantis crew to leave, uh, to leave Mir. And we close the hatch, and then the next day, it was uh, time to actually uh, undock uh, do our fly around and then get ready to come home. Actually, uh, before we undock, we did have one last opportunity to wave goodbye. From our overhead windows, we could see the uh, one uh, or several of the windows of Mir. And here we are waving uh, a final goodbye to our, to our compatriots up there. And then the, uh, it was time to actually do the undocking. With Ken at the controls, we released the hooks that were holding us in place, and springs pushed us away. Ken fired the jets right about here to get about a 0.2 uh, foot per second opening rate. Then from there, orbital mechanics accelerated our, our, uh, our, our rate of separation from Mir. There's a good picture of the thing that we got the privilege to add to Mir, the docking module. 
we had these pictures taken by the Mir crew as we uh, continued to move away. We moved out to a range of about 500, 525 feet from Mir. As we uh, moved to that distance, Mir rotated back to uh, its solar inertial attitude that would put its uh, solar, solar panels in the most advantageous orientation to the sun. Kim was generous enough to relinquish the, the controls for a period of time during the fly around to let me get the opportunity to experience uh, for the first time what it's like to fly the shuttle in space, and I really appreciated that. We flew two loops around Mir, two complete loops around Mir, and then Kim from the uh, forward compartment actually uh, did the separation burn uh, that finally separated us away from Mir. Well, the commander never let us forget that he was, in fact, a Marine colonel. And he was always up at the crack of dawn, in fact, before many times. And here he is shaving, and he's uh, already racked the rest of the crew out of their bunks and getting us ready to uh, start on another busy day of activities on orbit. You can see uh, Chris and uh, Jim shaving. And uh, Jim was one of these guys that did a lot of parallel ops. He's also brushing his teeth at the same time. <laughs> Uh, Jim's still brushing his teeth, and now, <laughs> and now Bill got into the act, and you see uh, Chris in the background there. He's reading his electronic mail. Well, Ken, as I said, was uh, always uh, anxious to make sure that his troops stayed in good shape. Uh, it's kind of like a Marine drill sergeant, and here's Chris getting in some morning exercise. And uh, I was uh, more into doing laps, so here I am getting some laps in on the mid-deck before the busy day's activities start. And you think that's easy to do, huh? <laughs> well, we demonstrate a little bit of physics. Here's a conservation of angular momentum as uh, we spin Chris around in the mid-deck. It's rather tight, but as he expands his legs and arms, you can see that his rotational rate slows down, and then when he brings them back together, it picks up again. Chris had told you during the slides that uh, seeing sunrises and sunsets is one of our favorite things on orbit. and. Uh, this, this video gives you a good feeling for how rapidly a sunset, in this case, occurs. And uh, we'll cut away to, a, I think, which is a very nice sequence here of you seeing from the elbow camera the sunset as it occurs on the orbiter. And you see that we have the lights on in the orbiter and continue to work through the dark periods of the orbit. Uh, we still had some secondary payloads in science to conduct prior to coming home. You can see we have a yaw rate. This is looking out the aft windows at a nighttime view of the horizon. And you're going to see the rockets, the, uh, the primary RCS jets fire, as Ken commands the orbiter to stop that yaw rate. And the, uh, as impressive as it is here, the oohs and ahs coming from the MSs at the aft flight deck looking out the window at this, uh, they were impressive, impressed also. Uh, shortly thereafter, it was time to do the flight control system check in order to get ready to come home. Here you see Ken uh, and myself and Jerry also going through that uh, fairly long procedure to make sure that all the APUs, the flight control systems, and the computers are ready to support entry. Here you'll see the hydraulically powered elevons going through one of their test sequences. And uh, shortly thereafter, uh, actually the next day, it was time to come home. As the orbiter re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, we experience temperatures on the outside of up to about 2,800 degrees. And that ionizes the atmosphere and leaves a contrail behind us that any jet would be proud to lay down. Here's a picture <laughs> of that contrail going back behind us. And if you, I think you could really see it for about 1,000 miles behind us. You can see the glow behind Ken. And here's Jerry demonstrating that, yes, we are starting to re-enter the Earth's gravitational field. Uh, out my window was the most spectacular view. We had to pull our flight track about 600 miles south. So we were banked to the right, and that gave me the prime window real estate. And this is from about 235,000 feet, about 50 miles in altitude, uh, going over the Canadian Cascades and Rockies. And that gives you a real feel for just the sensation of speed that you get at this point in the entry. Well, Jim was doing a lot more than giving us a travel log across that high altitude scorching path uh, down across the northern United States. But here, the whole crew on the flight deck, and I know the training team often wondered what we were doing up there in the motion base. And uh, this is how it looked. We were uh, busy monitoring the uh, displays, watching the orbiter, keeping track of uh, all of the systems as we headed down, uh, getting set up for the uh, intercept of the hack. Here, out the right-hand window, you can see some familiar territory, the uh, vehicle assembly building, as we lined up for the uh, final approach on to runway 33. It was cloudy that day. In fact, we logged an instrument approach on this one. Uh, we penetrated an overcast. 
And uh, here, as we come down about uh, 2,000 feet, the pre-flare was initiated. And here, the landing gear uh, Jim lowered at 300 feet as we lined up uh, on 3-3. It was a good day for flying and soaring, as you could see from that uh, little clip of the Eagle. Slight crosswind, but we had uh, overall good conditions. Uh, the lighting was just about perfect. We touched down and then uh, rolled out on 3-3. Here, we're using the aerodynamic braking and then the uh, drag chute, which has been a recent addition, but a real uh, brake saver, as uh, we used very little braking coming down the runway and uh, decelerating on the center line. This particular view on the next shot gives you a little bit of an idea how nice it was to bring uh, Atlantis back home. You can see as we rolled out, uh, bringing it to a stop towards the end of the runway, that the uh, launch pad behind us was sort of indicative of all of the phases of shuttle operations as uh, we launch from the background on a, on a morning uh, about a week ago and bring the vehicle back, uh, ready to be towed off and processed for another one. I think very close to the end there, you can see what I have to admit was a sigh of relief as the uh, wheels were stopped and then a chance to uh, thank and congratulate all the uh, crew there on the flight deck.